the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So today, um, we will. I was asked um, to speak briefly about four different stations of the cross. Uh, the fourth station, Jesus meets his mother Mary. The sixth station, the Veronica wives, the face of Christ. And the eighth station, Jesus meets with the woman Jerusalem. Yeah, the only thing about we should have uh, both. That's okay. You can see the images in your, in your presentation. Mm -hmm. So, I, of course, there is a common element here between the three stations. And what is the common element? That Jesus meet, we, meets with women, right? So it's very interesting this point of the stations of the cross. These four stations, these three stations, sorry, we can gather them together because there's something very unique about the meeting of Christ with women. You see in the images there that you have on the first, on your left, the number fourth station, Jesus encounters, this is a beautiful, um, it's, it's Duccio, the Maestau Duccio, if you go to Italy, you can see it. It's one panel in a gigantic, it's called the Maestai of the entire life of Christ. In uh, this wooden panel, it's basically an icon. But um, this is the encounter between Christ and, uh, and his mother. The one in the middle is an image of the face of Jesus Christ. Uh, we will talk about that. Uh, it's related, of course, to the station number six, huh? the encounter with the woman named Mer Veronica. And the last one on the image, on the, on the right, the last image is um, in Italian, uh, 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 again, it's, it's, it's a fresco, but um, um, represent, it's a particular of a larger, you know, as you can uh, uh, intuit, there is the encounter between Christ and the women of Jerusalem. Okay, so, as I said, this beautiful uh, three stations, we can gather some uh, common, uh, meaningful uh, thoughts about uh, why it, it's important for Christ to meet women. There is something about this encounter that is very important for our faith. And in the second slide, this, this time around I started from the theological point of view. Last time I started from the Gospel and then we made our way up to the theological significance. This time I do something different. We start from the theological meaning. So meaning, um, the meaning of these three stations from the point of view of our reflection about God, about faith. This is what it means, the theological reflection. And this is a, a quotation from Joseph Ratzinger, an article that he wrote in the 80s, 86. This is the picture of Cardinal Ratzinger. He wrote something about the connection between the church and uh, women. In particular, he says something very, very, very uh, unique. He says the church is a woman. So we can read the quotation, but um, the church is not a mechanical device. No merely an institution, no one of the user's sociological magnitudes. It is a person, it is a woman, it is a mother, right? Why do I put this? Because it seems to me in the encounter with Christ and the women, not the mother, Veronica, and the women of Jerusalem, there is a profound meaning uh, that is the meaning of actually Jesus is giving himself to us, and specifically to women who are able to welcome much more than men, of course. Uh, being a man, I know this, uh, and I notice in women, right? There's something about, there's something specific about being a woman, you know, that is a reflection of this welcoming of Christ, right? And this is why Joseph Ratzinger, um, you know, um, draws this parallelism between the church and the women. The church itself is a woman. Of course, Mary is the first and most important woman, but it's the first church too. You know, Christ is born in her. So in this encounter of Christ giving himself for us in the way of the cross, Jesus uh, kind of reaffirmed once again the fact that the church, first of all, is born as a gift, that we are what we welcome, right? And there's something very specific about this encounter with women, because Jesus is telling us that in women we see uh, much more clearly what the church is as welcoming than perhaps in men. So this is kind of the theological meaning of uh, why is important this encounter between Jesus and women in the way of the cross? Is it clear? Yeah. Okay, so now, having said that, keep this in mind because this principle will guide our understanding of the three stations that we are dealing with. So the first and the fourth station, 
Jesus encounters Mary, her mother. Um, you can see this to be more bigger. No? This image is a beautiful. Uh, I mean, uh, I like it so. But um, expression of the sorrow and the gaze between the unity between Christ and the man, as you can perhaps a little bit uh, see in this picture. In the New Testament, this is very interesting. In the New Testament, there is no mention of this particular encounter with Mary on the Via Dolorosa, on the way to on the cross. However, of course, we know very well that the mother is always with the son, right? Tradition, and also other passages of the scriptures. Mary is not mentioned much in the Gospels, but we know that Mary is always following Christ and the Apostles, right? And Mary is the only one who is underneath the cross, right? This is very interesting. So without even mentioning this encounter, the evangelist perhaps didn't want to say the obvious. Of course the, man, the woman, the, the mother is with the son. How can a mother leave the son when the son is in the pain? I mean, you mothers don't understand this. There's not even need of writing this. It's so obvious that the mother cares for the son, right? So it's very beautiful. So the tradition goes also back to, refers back to um, you know, Christ's life and in particular his passion. And there is a connection between this tradition in the way of the cross, in the station of the cross, this station, and the devotion to Mary as mother of sorrows. As you can see in the next uh, uh, slide, uh, this station is connected with somehow with this devotion. What are the seven sorrows of Mary? Perhaps we already touched upon this in our uh, study of the stations of the cross, but just to, um, of course, the, 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 here is the statue, right? With the seven um, sorrows, the seven uh, spheres that touch, that, that, that trust the, the heart of Mary. So the first one is, of course, you know, uh, of course, this devotion is um, developed and based also on some uh, uh, mystical uh, uh, visions of Saint Bridget of Sweden, right? And uh, um, if you turn the page, you I, I, I uh, put these seven sorrows. This is another beautiful image you know, uh, of Mary. Um, the first one is the prof the prophecy of Simon. Simon, the you know when, when the son Christ is presented to the temple, right? Remember, as a child to be circumcised and to be welcomed to the people of Israel. The old this old man says to Mary. And to you yourself, not only to Christ, this man, this, this, this child will be destined to be a, a, a sign of contradiction, right? But then he, 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 he tells to the mother, to Mary, you yourself, a sword will pierce your heart, right? So that's the first sorrow. The second one is when Jesus, Mary, and Joseph are forced to go to Egypt, right? To leave, to, to flee the, the, the homeland. Because Herod is trying to kill Christ, right? So the second sorrow is there. And then you can read the passage of the Gospel um, that refer to this. The third one is, of course, when Christ, you know, a young uh, uh, Christ, a teenage Christ, a teenager, who goes with um, Mary and Joseph to the temple, no, to Jerusalem, to, to worship God, and, 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 and Jesus remains there, not to talk, to reveal himself, I mean, to, to explain the scriptures to the doctors of the, of the temple, and, 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 G, and, and Mary is afraid because Mary and Joseph, they think that uh, 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 it, um, the child is lost. As a mother would be very in pain knowing that what happened to my child, of course. Then, of course, the fourth is the carrying of the cross, right? Um, to see the son uh, carrying the cross. The fifth, you know, and in particular the fourth is um, in connection with the stations that we are reading, the fifth is the crucifixion of Christ, to see, you know, the death of Jesus on the cross. The number six is when Jesus is taken down from the cross. This is a beautiful, if you go also in our church, the station, the, the, the station of, of the cross, the number 13, they represent the, the taking of Christ from the, from the cross. There is the mother welcoming the, the dead body of Jesus, of course. And of course, as the mother, seeing your son dying is not... Uh, is something that should not happen, of course. Mm -hmm. the parents should die before uh, the sons. Anyhow, and the last story is, of course, uh, when Jesus' is, body is, is laid in the tomb, right? To bury your son. Anyhow, so there is a profound connection between this meeting. Like, 
as if in the devotional, you know, the devotion of, of, of Mary, the sorrowful mother, in this fourth station, we kind of see a, a, a summary of all these seven sorrows, right? This encounter, which we don't know um, what happened to in that moment, but what we know is, of course, this profound unity between the mother and the son. And again, remember what I said before about the theological interpretation. The mother is also the church, right? So we welcome, we, 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 we also too partake of the, of the sorrows and the suffering of Christ as church. So that's briefly about this fourth station and the importance of the first station in, 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 in the life of Mary uh, with Christ, right? Uh, again, this is very important. Uh, this unity between the mother and the son and for all the different uh, meanings that, that, that this relationship implies. One of them is, again, Mary is representing all of us right, as church, as welcoming Christ. Clear? Okay, let's move to the sixth station, the second encounter with another woman. This time is very interesting, this encounter with this woman named Veronica. Um, as you may have read, uh, I think last week in bulletin, or, or this week, I don't remember, or two weeks ago, but Father Edward is writing, he is trying to show us the different uh, characters in the way of the cross, and two weeks ago, last week, I don't remember, he spoke about <coughs> the, the encounter with Veronica, and there is a beautiful, um, a beautiful explanation of what the name means. Um, I also, well, first of all, Again, there is no explicit mentioning of this encounter in the New Testament. Again, we know very well that this that doesn't mean that doesn't exist because our faith is not based only on scriptures. We are not, I mean, I don't know if there is a Protestant among us, but those uh, who are Catholic, we believe that uh, revelation is you know, also in tradition, right? Like the tradition of your family is interesting. But how do you explain you know, when you go to visit, go to visit the family and they eat in a certain way? They say a certain prayer. It's their own little tradition, right? But there is not necessarily anything written about that. It's just uh, you know, passed on by generation, in generations after generations, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the same when we speak about those things that are not contained in the letter of the New Testament or in the scriptures, right? So this is important. Anyhow, why? Because this is very interesting. Because, again, it's a perfect example how the tradition developed. And uh, even though there is no explicit mentioning in the gospel, but I think, by the way, they say the first time that if you do this exercise for those who like history, um, you will trace back. You know, where is the first time that we have some sort of a written account or mentioning of this woman connected to this episode? You know, Eusebius of Caesarea, the first historian of the church who wrote the first history of the church in the fourth century. Uh, we have a mention in, in, in a little chapter, a short chapter of this history of this woman. And it, it, it's very interesting because um, Eusebius associate, associates this woman with the woman cured in the gospel, uh, suffering you know, mm -hmm. of, of, of loss of blood, right? And this, we don't know whether this is truly the same woman, but it's interesting that Eusebius in the fourth century somehow connects the devotion to the woman healed in the, in the gospel, by the way, it's a significant healing, huh? with this woman that meets Christ on the way to the cross. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, you know, there's something to think about, uh, how uh, all things are somewhat connected, and, and there is some sort of historical, uh, you know, if you read this, you, 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 you discover things. The, the other thing is, again, you see the last week in Bulletin, Father Edgar made a beautiful explanation about the name, what the name Veronica means, it's an association of Latin and Greek, which is very interesting. Uh, which means, you know, they are icon, true icon, true image. That's what the name Veronica means. It's put together a Latin word, vero, which means truth, no? and icon, which comes from the Greek, which means image. So uh, the name itself, Veronica, basically means what, he, what she did, what happened in that encounter. Again, the names are not just random things. You, know, you you may name your sons or daughters uh, with a certain name because there is a connection with an event or with a person. I said, right? I was named Peter because there was a Peter in my family. My you know, my father wanted me to continue the you know. 
So this incarnation is someone else, right? The same here, the name is not just random, but is associated with what happened. And what happened? Of course, the only is that woman who wipes the, the face of Jesus as he goes to Calvary. And what happened is the miracle. That's why their icon, true icon. Uh, the face of Jesus is uh, imprinted in this, uh, in this veil, right? Um, so the name, um, you know, it, it's beautiful to think about this way. Now, the tradition, of course, uh, this is for another class because it's very detailed and, and, and long, but maybe next year we can talk about this. But um, there are six images or copies of an image. This is very interesting. It may be there is a copy and not the original, but there are six places, six, six shrines in the world that claim to have either an image or a copy of the original of this veil. Now, um, again, this is for another class because it will make further explanation. But again, it's interesting that uh, it might be the, it might be all images of a copy of the image. Sorry. So this is interesting, right? It's not that we have perhaps six veils, maybe one of them. Now, I put the face, the face that you hear, and then we. It, 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 I, 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 I only want to mention one that I will mention later on. One of these images is this one that you are here. Is kept in Manopello. I put it because it's in Italy, so I have my former identity as an Italian. Um, so um, one of these images is kept in this little little town up in the in the in Abruzzi, so an hour, two hours, we can say east uh, northeast of Rome. You can if you go to Italy, you should go to this little little town up in the mountains, and there is a shrine, little church. That, um, where you can contemplate this image. And this is the so-called veil, the face of Manopello. Now, keep this in mind, in, a, in two slides we will talk more about this. Um, so before the face, um, we go, uh, so part of the tradition, as I said last time, is also we can draw some uh, uh, you know, good information from different the life of the saints. And as I mentioned last time, referring to the movie The Passion of Christ by Mel Gibson, that movie was based, highly based and influenced by this account of this saint, of the, of the visions of this saint, Catherine Emmerich. And uh, last time I shared the passage where Catherine uh, describes the encounter with the, Syrian, with the Simon of Cyrene. This time I didn't, I just put a paragraph, and what you have there is the basically chapter, no? the other copies, Photocopies I give you is the chapter taken from the book of this Catherine Emery, where she describes what she sees happening uh, in the encounter between Veronica and uh, um, and Jesus. And it's very interesting because she, by the way, confirms some most of the most of the data that we find from the tradition are confirmed by her visions, which is very interesting, right? But also, she says, some, she added some particulars that are very interesting. One of them that this woman was related to, um, you know, uh, to John the Baptist, uh, parents, Zachariah. So there was some sort of relationship there. But you can read, uh, this is simply the ancient, the beginning of the chapter. So you can read the old chapter by yourself of the vision of Catherine Emmerich uh, that describes the encounter between this woman and. Uh, 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 by the way, she said about the name too, uh, the, uh, uh, Veronica, the Vera icon, no? she repeats this point. Anyhow, this is just for you to see how a devotion to the saint, Catherine Emery, reading of her vision can be helpful for us to put ourselves into, to contemplate more the mystery of, of that station, right? Now, again, you read it by yourself. The, 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 going back to the veil of Manopello, I put this, uh, the, the, you see uh, Joseph Benedict XVI as a pope, it's interesting. Um, it's not because the Pope goes there, of course, this is the veil, but there's some sort of important significance that the Pope, a Pope, in this case was Benedict, visited the shrine of Manopello, kind of giving some sort of endorsement. So, of course, he's not a politician giving endorsement to a veil, but there's something interesting. Uh, now, why did Pope Benedict went there? There were some studies done previously in the 90s, in the early 2000s, about this veil. Mm -hmm. And they found out very interesting things, like the way in which this veil is made, it goes back, you know, 
to the first century, all these things that you can read on the internet. But uh, other things, they studied put this face uh, and uh, on uh, comparison with the Shroud of Turin. You know, the Shroud of Turin is traditionally, we will, I mean, it's, it's a relic we say that of the shroud that covered Christ, the body of Christ when he, when he, after, after he died, right? So what they did, some studies, you can go on the internet and find this and read it, but uh, the scholars, they, what they did, they also put uh, the image of Mano Pelo and compared this with the image of the shroud, and they found many, many, many interesting similarities, of course. Now, it's interesting because this face, you can see, is not the face of someone who is die pretty soon, which is in and of itself also interesting because we can explain this in two ways. First of all, Jesus maybe wanted to impress that face, not so much in his own suffering, but his own, to show that the suffering is a revelation of the glory, right? So in other words, there is something more beautiful, perhaps. Another explanation, which is more, perhaps, the right one, I don't know, is that the veil of Veronica actually this veil, sorry, this veil is not the veil um, uh, on during the, the, the way of the cross, but it's the veil that was put on the face of Christ when he died, right, to cover the face, right? Which it would be much, it's it, it easy because if you actually compare this with, you know, it's a testimony of the resurrection because, of course, his eyes are open, right? So it's kind of the imprint that he left, so to speak, when he's when he gets raised from the dead, you know? that's another possible explanation. And you know, it's very interesting when you go to Italy. I actually personally, I never been to this shrine. So uh, why? Because first, after before the visit of Benedict, you know, it was not very popular. Like you know, uh, well, okay, people knew about this, but really the this the very interesting visit kind of open up a new a new chapter in the in the devotion to this holy face. And I put a couple of passages from the beautiful homily that Benedict gave when he went there. No? Because, of course, he helps us understand that the point is not just curiosity for the sake of curiosity, but a relic is a way, is something that helps us pray, right? And he says something beautiful. He says, and maybe I read it this, no? You can read, if you go on Google, you go on, uh, you type September 1st, 2006, Benedict 16, Manopello, you have the entire text, no? Of, of the of the homily, but he says he who has seen me has seen the Father, right? Yes, dear brothers and sisters, but he says to see God, no, it is necessary to know Christ and to let oneself be molded by His Spirit, no, who guides believers into the truth. Very beautiful. So, in order to see and to recognize that as the face of Christ, of course, you have to have the desire to see Christ. You have to be already touched by the face of Jesus somehow. And then he says, your face of God I seek, seek the face of Jesus. And that seeking the face of Jesus must be the longing of all us Christians. So it's very beautiful because going there, you can see a relic, and that can be helpful, uh, can be helpful for your faith to grow, no? So ask yourself, do I seek the face of God? No? Do I seek the face of Christ? No? Always, as Benedict says, the longing of all Christian people. So anyhow, you know, that's also interesting, no? Our relics can help us. We're not just people curious about historical facts or things, random things, but you know, there is a profound meaning connected to our own. They help us deepening our own faith. Oh, that was, that, that's the meaning of the relics. <coughs> and this is a beautiful harmony of, of Ratzinger, so you should uh, read it. Uh, uh, you should read all of it. Okay, the last station um, in which we see this encounter with the women is the eighth station, right? And this is the, actually the only one of the three in which we have a, a, an account in the Gospel, right? In the Gospel of Luke, uh, we can read, you know, in chapter 23, verses 28 31. And Jesus turned to them, to the women, and said, Daughter of Jerusalem, do not weep for yourself. For your children, for indeed the days are coming when people will say, Blessed are the very in the, wound, the wounds that never bore and the breasts that never thirst. At that time, people will say to the mountains, fall, fall upon us, and to the hills, cover us. For in these things, for if these things are done, when the, when the wood is great, then what will happen when it is dry? So this is 
the words of this encounter no, between the women of Jerusalem and Christ. Now, how do we understand this encounter? Why is that meaningful? Why did, did he make the tradition and why, why is it so important that we, we have a station of the way of the cross um, dedicated to them? And here again, I want to go to, back to Ratzinger um, because it helps us put in things in, in, a, in a perspective of faith. In 2005, I don't know if you, for those old like me, you might remember the 2005 Holy Week was very particular, very, very special, because JP2 was on his last days of his earthly life, and most of the you know, um, ceremonies or, 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 or liturgies of the Holy Week were, were done, presided by other by cardinals, and especially Ratzinger, who was at the time the dean of the College of the Cardinals, so the one in charge, so to speak, of, uh, you know, keeping an eye on, 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 on what's going on in the church, he also has responsibility when the, when the Pope is sick. Anyhow, he was asked, Ratzinger, to um, uh, every year, now the there is the way of the cross in the Colosseum, that's why I put this one. If you go to Rome during the Holy Week, you can participate in the, in the liturgies uh, presided by the Pope, and the, uh, and the Good Friday way of the cross is always done in the Colosseum or Rome, in outside, no? there are stations, uh, and the meditations are written by uh, someone to whom the Pope asked, right? In that case, Joseph Ratzinger was asked by JP2 to write the prayers and the meditations of each station, and became also famous because, um, I don't know if you remember, I do, I was actually in Rome uh, when last uh, uh, year, I mean, uh, I, I, I left in 2006, but I remember really because I was there in Rome during those days, and uh, you might remember this image that is all over the internet now, but um, JP doing his private chapel on, on, on a chair, right? Holding tight the cross, watching uh, uh, live, not through TV, the stations of the cross. And, and have you seen that image? It's, it's very powerful and very beautiful. Uh, the old saintly Pope, bended by illness and, and sickness, holding tight to the cross, and while watching, on TV, the way of the cross uh, at the Colosseum, because of course he couldn't be there. And, you know, it's, it's a very moving picture, it's a very moving event. Um, it's the famous way of the cross in which Ratzinger brought about uh, you know, uh, the, the, the scandals in the church, and, you know, <laughs> etc. It's, it's a very powerful text you know, for those who would like to venture and read it. You can find everything on, on the Vatican website. But anyhow, yeah, as it comes to the eighth station, uh, Ratzinger wrote this beautiful prayer to explain the meaning of this encounter between Christ and the women of Jerusalem. He says, Lord, to the weeping women you spoke of repentance and the day of judgment. When all of us will stand before your face, again, the connection with the station before, not the face, uh, the, 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 the Veronica face, the face of Christ. No, we will stand. The judgment will be not, you know, something, uh, I mean, we don't know, that, of course, but uh, uh, what we know by what we can gather from the tradition, from the words of Christ, judgment means to be in front of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. To see us in front of, in and through the face of Jesus. Huh? So, it says, before the judge of the world, uh, you call us to leave behind the trivializations of evil, not those life of evil. Which, which uh, uh, solves our conscience and allows us to carry on as before. And then he said, you show us the seriousness of the responsibility, our responsibility. And this is the, the point I, I want to emphasize, now, the danger of our being found guilty. All right? And then he says, grant that we may simply walk at your side with nothing to offer other than compassionate words. Convert us and give, a new, give us new life. Now, grant that in the end, we will not be dry wood, but living branches no? in you. And then he goes back to the last words of Christ, no? in, that we just read, bearing fruit for eternal life. No? So what is the meaning in the life, uh, our life for Christian life? Why do we contemplate this dialogue? And what is Jesus telling us? It seems to me, first of all, again, the, the, to take seriously, to, I mean, to take seriously, to, to make sure that we understand that we have a responsibility, right? We are responsible. The Christianity is not just 
some you know, magical you know, uh, uh, thing that happens. You know? The church is not, go back to the first slide, or the church is not this mechanical device, it's not this secret society, but it's, the, it's Christ entrusting himself to you and asking you to be responsible, to respond, to say yes, right? to welcome Jesus. So the focus here is the seriousness of this responsibility. Right? We will be, uh, uh, we will have to account, uh, to give an account of our own responsibility. Of course, and then the last thing, you know, the prayer. We want to pray, so that's why we pray this station. Not so much because we want to focus on our lack of responsibilities, but we want to regain this strength in, in seeking Christ in and through Jesus himself. No? And convert us. We have, to, we have to ask for conversion. No? To be with you, to, to simply be with you. As he says here, with the beautiful, no? he says, uh, granted we may not simply walk at your side, you know, with nothing to offer, other than compassion and what so it's a real conversion, it's a real you know, um, relationship that Jesus is seeking to establish with us. So this is the meaning. You know, it's interesting because in the act of contemplation of what Jesus is doing, he's always speaking to us, right? He's always an act of re receiving. That's why the last slide is connected to the first one, if you will. This idea of what do we learn from this encounter with these women. The responsibility of welcoming Christ, not saying yes, no, as, as Mary did, no, as the Veronica did, as the women did, no, to, to welcome Jesus because the church is, is, this, uh, is a woman, is this person, is being able to uh, open up our heart and life to Jesus and, and, and be with him. Right? And yeah, this concludes my short presentation about these three stations. Um, you can, uh, of course, read uh, more. No, this is the chapter. Um, in the life of, uh, in the visions of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, St. Catherine Emmerich, no? chapter 34, in one of the volumes, there are four volumes, as I may show, uh, you can read it, um, you can read it uh, by yourself, um, in your silence, in your prayer, and then um, you can research more no? about the, the veil, and the different, we can talk more, maybe next year we can do more in depth, these, Showing a little bit more these uh, studies, no? No, about this veil of Manopello, and, and uh, you can go to Italy and, and you see it, of course. Uh, so maybe one day we can do that too. Uh, yeah. A few years ago, I watched uh, some things on forms on the shroud. Oh, yeah, right? good. And good. they talked about the they, lighting up. Oh, the good. That very, very nice. So form, you know what form is. We have access. We as parishioners, so you can ask. Very good. Maybe you can. We can uh, find that video and, and, and watch. Thank you. I, I, two or three years ago, I watched it, but it was so good. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, also, the I don't remember now because also I, I don't remember. I don't remember the, the, all the technicalities. But fascinating is the is the material of this video, mm -hmm. which is very very unique. Right. Um, and the way in which it's, it's made. So it's kind of miraculous in and of itself, the veil itself, not only the image. Uh, anyhow, also the shroud, it's part of the, the mysteries. How can, how can we can keep that kind of relic after 2,000 years, right? So, um, anyhow, thank you. Yeah. I haven't watched that one particular one in the form, but I will. Any, any, anything else? 